Um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us here today, uh, particularly our international viewers who are doing this at a relatively uncomfortable uh, time zone in, in many cases. So, so thank you all for joining us. Um, today we're going to talk about developing web bots and spiders. And we're actually going to talk a little bit more than just about developing them because the problem with web bots and spiders is that if you only know how to develop them, you can get yourself into a little bit of trouble. So let's look at what exactly we are going to be covering here today. Um, first thing we're going to cover is what are the opportunities for bot developers? Um, then we're going to talk about some web bot development basics. And by basics, I mean pretty, pretty basic. Then we're going to talk about considerations for online property rights, uh, things like um, copyright and trespass to chattels and that type of thing. And we're also going to talk about dealing with difficult websites, uh, particularly cases where you have a lot of JavaScript and Flash and that type of things. And then another issue that comes up um, constantly asked about is web bots and stealth. In other words, how to create a web bot that operates fairly, um, um, fairly stealthy so it's not detected, and what are the legitimate reasons for doing that kind of thing. And then finally, we're going to wrap things up with a discussion about how to deploy a large-scale um, um, web bot, uh, basically uh, how, how to build a botnet is basically what we're going to be talking about, large-scale deployment of distributed web bots. So who am I? Um, I've got contact information here, and this is probably the last time you're going to see this. So if you want to jot some of this stuff down, this would be the time to do it. Uh, we've got a Facebook page for web bots. Uh, you can contact me at, at Twitter. And my, my Twitter title, I basically call it the life of a web bot writer. Um, there's also my email address there if you ever need to get a hold of me. I am the author of Web Bot Spiders and Screen Scrapers uh, through No Starch Press. Uh, first edition came out in 2007. The second edition is uh, new, and it's out this month. And it's available at uh, the No Starch website, both in book form and also in um, uh, the form of PDF. It's also available on the O'Reilly website as well as through O'Reilly uh, Safari, and it's on Amazon and, and just about everywhere right now. Uh, the second edition is um, we, we basically touched every chapter in the first edition. We eliminated two chapters. Uh, we added a chapter on regular expressions. We added a chapter on proxies. We added two chapters on um, developing bots for, again, difficult websites. And we've got another chapter on uh, large-scale deployment. I try to speak at DEF CON whenever I can. Uh, the first two talks, DEF CON 10 and 12, are available on the DEF CON website, an introduction to writing spiders and bots, uh, and then corporate intelligence. Uh, those were done quite a while ago, and they're probably not really current at this point. Uh, but they're available out there. Uh, DEF CON 15, uh, executable image exploit, and DEF CON 17, Scraping Difficult Websites, those are both available on my website, uh, shrink.com. I've been writing bots for, I believe it's about 17 years now, and I've worked everywhere from Moscow to Silicon Valley. In fact, I spend about, I'm, I'm based in Las Vegas, but I spend about a third of my time in San Jose. And recently I've been doing a lot of work with journalists, uh, primarily in Europe. Uh, I've, I've do workshops for the uh, Center for Investigative Journalism in London, and I've also done things for uh, the VVOJ, which is the um, Dutch-Flemish version of basically the same organization. I've done stuff for them both in Belgium and in the Netherlands. And uh, I've been on BBC World Service, and I've done something recently for Southern California Public Radio. The website that you should reference during this is uh, WebBot Spiders Screen Scrapers. Uh, there will be some libraries that are available there that you might find useful. And uh, I make reference to that site a couple times throughout the presentation. Okay, what are the opportunities for web bot developers? Well, basically, and this is, this is key, the opportunities for web bot projects come from the limitations of browsers. You have to remember that um, the 
internet, or excuse me, the browsers are made to be very general purpose tools. And where WebBot shine is when you can figure out some very, very task specific kinds of things to do. So right now the internet is used as you know for many, many business tasks. And the problem with using a browser to do this kind of stuff is that, well, there's, there's four of them I'm going to point out here. The first is that browsers cannot filter information for relevance. And we all know that half of the stuff we look at, even when we follow a link, isn't relative to what, we're, what we need. The other problem with browsers is that they are unable to aggregate information. Um, so instead of having to go to many, many different places, a bot should be able to um, aggregate all that information and get it all to you in one place. The third thing is that browsers cannot in interpret what they find online. So you may be looking for something very, very specific, uh, but the browser is um, they're not able to interpret what they're looking at. Then the final thing is that, and this is, this is probably the key one here, is that browsers are not able to act on your behalf. So if um, so once you, the bot finds something of, of interest, you should actually be able to go out and do something. For example, it should be able, if it finds a product that you want to buy, it should really be able to go off and buy it, right? Um, the important thing to remember is that it's really all about gaining a competitive advantage. Um, that's really what I do for my clients is I, I gain competitive advantages because we do things with the Internet that other people don't do. Um, the day of doing something on the Internet and just because you're on the Internet, this no longer gives you a competitive advantage. You have to do things that other people are not doing, and that usually involves web bots and spiders. So here are some examples of things that people have done with bots. Um, this is track rates, and basically what track rates does is it goes out and it looks at hotel prices and um, it presents that information, it does statistical analysis on that information, and it tells hotel operators how they should be pricing their rooms. Because currently there really are no tools like that. Um, this gives hotel operators a, a really great idea of knowing exactly what their market looks like so they can go out there and price accordingly. Another example is um, this particular bot. This is uh, websiteoptimization.com. This bot goes off and it analyzes web pages and determines where opportunities are for optimizing the pages so that they will download faster. Uh, this is one of my favorites, uh, PokerBot. There's actually a lot of these out there. And what a PokerBot does is it basically plays poker for you. Um, and it will play perfect statistical, you know, perfect, every hand is played perfectly talk about a competitive advantage. Um, here, here's some other examples of things that, that can be helpful. Uh, you can write a bot that helps your boss stay informed. Uh, you can create a bot that's a news aggregator, and you can say, well, you know, there are RSS feeds and stuff for that. But in this case, you can also write the bot so that it only shows stories that are relevant to this person's interests. You could also ignore stories that are redundant. So if they've read them once before, you don't have to present them again. And um, any, any stories that look like other stories, you can kind of figure that out and only present the one story that's unique. It's another example, um, purchase a store's inventory. And actually, I do quite a bit of this kind of work. I do a lot of procurement type of work. Uh, you can create a bot that searches the Internet for you know, various online stores. And when it comes across a product that's underpriced, it can flag that. And again, a web bot can actually act on your behalf. So you could program the bot to actually go off and make the purchase if you like. And uh, I've done this in the past. In fact, I've written web bots that have purchased, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of automobiles. So you're not limited to, to buying, you know, Pez dispensers. You can write bots that do some real serious business for people. Another example, and this one's a little bit different, um, monitor website security. If you have a website where you've got multiple logins and people have different access levels, it, it's an absolute nightmare if people log in and they aren't directed to the right page. Well, what you could do is you could write a bot that logs in with all the appropriate logins, and you can verify 
that the pages that people see are the appropriate pages and that they're not accessing anywhere on the website that they uh, shouldn't be going. And again, it's all about creating a competitive advantage. Um, all the bots I write do something unique for people and they all create a advantage for the client that uh, their competitors don't have. And that's what's really different about writing a web bot as opposed to developing a web page. Okay, web bot development basics. Um, I write everything in PHP and I've been doing that since probably 2000. Uh, prior to that, I was a pretty much hardcore Java developer. The reasons I use PHP is that it can do anything that any other language does. There, there's nothing that you can do in .NET or C Sharp or Java that you really cannot do uh, from a web bot perspective at least um, with PHP. I like the fact that I can develop in one environment and deploy in another. And typically I do. I typically develop in Windows and I deploy either in FreeBSD or in some flavor of Linux. Uh, there are no license issues, which I like. Uh, versions of LAMP, very, typically they're all compatible with each other so that you don't have to worry about the version of your, um, of your, your servers not you know, working together. Everything just seems to work. Um, I really like LAMP Server, and if you haven't come across LAMP Server, it's something you should look into. Uh, what LAMP Server does is it's a free download, and it installs your Apache, your MySQL, and your PHP all at one time, and it works really nicely. The other thing I like about using PHP is that it has a very large developer base, and because of that, it means if I need to get additional resources on a project, it's easy for me to find people to do that, uh, much more so than if I were doing something a little more specific like Ruby or, or um, ASP or something. I also use browser macros, um, and we'll be talking a little bit about that today too. Um, and again, browser macros, and particularly iMacros, very useful when it comes to um, when you've got websites that are just very difficult to, to, uh, to do. Okay, let's talk about some basics here. It's very important when you become a bot developer that you stop thinking about the world, stop thinking about the internet in terms of websites and start thinking about things as a collection of files. Because what we're gonna be doing here is, you know, the very first thing you do is you end up downloading a file of some type. Now, PHP has many, many functions for doing this kind of thing. F open, file, get contents, file, I believe there are a few more, um, and you can use those for downloading files, but I encourage you not to. I very much encourage you to use the curl extension of PHP, uh, known as PHP curl. Doing so has a lot of advantage. First off, it handles cookie management for you. And, you know, both the cookies that are temporary sitting in memory and the ones that are written to the hard disk can be an absolute um, disaster trying to manage that kind of stuff, stuff yourself. So I highly encourage you to use PHP because it'll handle all that stuff for you automatically. It handles all kinds of HTTP header redirections. You can even tell it the number of times that um, you know you will allow a redirection. So you can set a limit, which is very nice. It handles encryption. All you have to do to use SSL um, in curl is change the protocol from HTTP to HTTPS and assuming that the site you're accessing is um, SSL encrypted, everything is just transparent and it just works beautifully. Uh, PHP curl also will facilitate all your get, post, and file methods, which is nice. Um, it's, it's difficult to write a post method, um, but uh, it comes for free with curl. It also lets you do some cool things, like you can choose your client name so instead of calling your web bot, um, I think the, the default is curl, then whatever the version level is, you can uh, emulate a browser if you want. And sometimes that's important because sometimes you come across a website that only works for Microsoft or it only works for uh, um, Firefox or what have you. So it's important sometimes to be able to choose your own client name. And the client name, by the way, is what the web administrator will see in the log files to see who access their websites. 
It handles refers, it handles timeouts, it handles errors, it handles all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, it also returns transfer status, which is pretty slick. So you can tell uh, how long it took to download things, uh, how long the DNS look, uh, lookup took, uh, various things like that. Well, let me let me go back one. Um, now there's a library that I wrote and that I talk about in my book called libhttp. And that library is available again from WebBots, Spiders, and Screen Scrapers. And we'll be talking about that library a bit here. Okay, so if you want to file using um, using libhttp, this is all you have to do. You first include the file, the standard. You set up your target, and the target is the file that you want to download. And you define your referrer, and if you remember the referrer, what that is, is again, in the log files, whatever you set up as your referrer will basically indicate the link that you came from. And sometimes this is very important because sometimes um, uh, back ends of websites are set up so that if you're following certain links, you need to follow them in specific order. Um, so you always want to catch your refer and do that as well. So basically this is all you have to do. It's just a couple lines of code, and this few lines of code will download the target, uh, which is the home page of my website. So what does that return? It actually returns an array of three things. Uh, one of them is the file, which is simply the file contents. You have a status, which itself is an array of transfer information, and then you have an error that comes back. So what is in the status? And I, I realize that this um, slide has a lot of really small stuff on it, and part of that is intentional to show that there's a lot of stuff that comes back. But you can see it comes back with things like, you know, the header size, the request size, um, some SSL information, total time it took to do the download, the name lookup, the connect time, all kinds of cool stuff like this. Probably the most important thing here is the HTTP code, and that's what the third one that was returned. And you can see in this case it was returned at 200, which means everything went well. Uh, but it's important to look at that to make sure that um, the page you downloaded um, actually downloaded correctly before you start trying to parse it or something or processing it. What's in the air? Uh, well, hopefully nothing. Um, I really don't rely on this very much. Um, and it's, it's there and it will return error codes, but I think it's much more important to rely on the HTTP code. Uh, the error code is maybe something you'd use for, for debugging. Okay, downloading online files, web pages, images, et cetera, is easy with PHP curl. Uh, that's, that's basically what I want you to know about downloading. Uh, the library is available at the website, and I highly encourage you to download it and take a look at it. Again, it, it uses curl, and it, all the cookie stuff is all transparent. All that other stuff is all transparent. You don't have to worry about it. The other thing that's important, one of the basics, is parsing. And basically, parsing is once you download the web page, you need to separate the information you want from all the other stuff, all the formatting and all that kind of stuff. So basically, parsing is all about string manipulation. Now, just like uh, PHP has lots of ways for downloading files, it also has a lot of string manipulation functions. And when I first started doing this, it was very confusing because there were so many choices. And I'm a very, very firm believer that the key to effective parsing is to limit the size of your tool set. In other words, the temptation is to use every single method available to, to parse things out. And what I'm saying is if you've got four or five tools for parsing that you always use, you're going to find out that you can do just about everything with a very small tool set, and you're going to save yourself a lot of time. Which leads me to another library that you should know about that's also available at the website, and that is libparse, which we're going to talk about right now. So in libparse, there are, what, five main routines that get used all the time. And using these five or combinations of the five, it will handle 99% of your parsing needs, and you'll be able to parse things very, very efficiently and very quickly. Uh, and basically, all you need to know, all you need to be able to do to do this is have the ability to split a string, 
to return the contents between two what I call landmarks, uh, to return an array of things. So if you've got things that are repetitive, you can return a, an array of things, like you can return an array of all the links, of all the images, what have you. Um, I've got one called get attribute, which is handy for returning attributes within HTML tags. And then the last one, not used all that much, but I've got one called remove, which actually will allow you to do things like remove all the JavaScript, uh, remove all the links, that kind of stuff. So let's take a look at split string here real quick. Uh, split string, basically, you, you tell it um, you, you've got a raw string, you've got a landmark where you want things to split. You tell it if you want to split before or after the landmark, and then you tell it whether or not you want to include the landmark in your return set. Return between is, is very useful, and basically it's set up the same way. You have a raw string, you've got a start and end landmark. In between that is the stuff you want to return, and then you tell it whether or not you want to return um, uh, the landmarks or not. This is really useful for doing things like parsing XML kind of stuff, where you just tell it the tag you're looking for, and it'll return everything between the tag. Uh, array, uh, this is the one you would use if you want to return an array of tables, links, JavaScript, any place where you've got things that are repetitive, and you can just grab all of those things out of the web page. For example, in this case, you see we're including libparse. We're defining our open tag as, uh, as an image tag, and then we've got the close tag, which is the close of the image tag, and then we just say parse array, here's our raw string, open tag, close tag, and it will return in this particular case, all of the image tags that are on a website. Now, if you notice what I did there is um, I didn't give the entire open tag. I just gave enough to define what it is. Um, didn't start defining any of the attributes or anything like that because it's not needed. Uh, get attribute is really slick. Uh, with get attribute, you can do things like uh, you can tell it the tag that you're looking for. You can define the tag. And in this particular case, the attribute we're looking for is width, and this would return the width of that particular image. Here's an example where we are combining parse array with get attribute. And what this does very effectively is, again, we, we define open tag. Actually, we're returning uh, all the links on a page. Um, we define the open tag and the close tag of the link. And we get our array of link tags, and then we set up a simple loop, and we grab the attribute, which is the href. So basically, this is going to pull down all of the pages that are referenced on that web page. And we're doing it with just a couple lines of code. And as you can see, this would be a very easy thing to do if you're developing a spider that follows links. Uh, string remove or remove, basically, like I said before, uh, the example I've got here. We're defining the open and close tags for uh, JavaScript, and this will just uh, return the web page minus all the JavaScript, which is often very handy. Or you could, you could uh, remove all the comments, or you could remove all the tables, or anything where you can define the beginning and the end of something, it'll remove all of them. Um, again, just in closing on parsing, uh, parsing is easy when you limit your choices and you use libparse. Okay, I'm going to move on now uh, to submitting a form. Um, this, in this particular example, uh, what we're doing, the form that we're submitting is uh, basic authentication. We're, we're logging into a website. And you notice we're using the routine again from HTTP, libHttp. Uh, instead of uh, HTTP get, we're doing HTTP post form. And you notice the format's very similar. The difference here is that uh, we have an additional uh, thing that we're passing to the routine called the post array. And basically, it's a, it's a pair of the name of the form element and the data for the form element. This kind of thing makes um, passing information to forms, very, very simple. In the result, again, it returns the same format as HTTP GET, where you've got uh, a file status and an error that's returned. Again, submitting forms is easy with web HTTP. Uh, it's important to always make sure that you're submitting the right form. Um, 
one of the things that I, I have for you on, on my website is a form emulator, or form analyzer rather. And with the form analyzer, you can it'll, you can send it the the form, and it'll analyze it and it'll tell you what form fields you need to uh, to fill out. And that's that's pretty useful as well. And again, that's all available at the website, and that's all in the library lib HTTP. Okay, I want to talk. A little bit. Now you know how to basically download the internet and to post forms. Um, now it's a good time to maybe put on the brakes a little bit and talk a little bit about online property rights. So some of the things that we're going to talk about here are copyright. We're going to talk about something called trespass to chattels, and I want to conclude this little part on um, a mistake that I made a long time ago, where I got into a little bit of trouble with one of the state court systems. Um, so a lesson for all of us there. Thing to remember about copyright, and probably the most important thing to remember, is that you don't want to become an armchair lawyer. If you've got a question, um, find expert advice. And the thing to remember there is that, or that um, online law is not terribly well defined. Um, there's not a lot of case law. Um, so what you want to do is you want to stay informed. When you go to a website, again, assume that all rights are reserved. So just because they may um, have a copyright notice but they don't specifically say you can't do something with the information, don't assume that you can. Something very important to remember is that you cannot copyright a fact. And you know what is a fact? Well, that might be open to interpretation a little bit. But you cannot copyright a fact. That would include things like a price. A price is not a fact. Uh, an address is not a fact. Or an address is a fact, excuse me. An address is a fact. A price is a fact. A phone number is a fact. Um, none of those things are subject to copyright. The thing that is subject to copyright, though, are collections of facts. So if you want to open up the phone book and publish a phone number, you have every legal right to do that. What you do not have the right to do is publish the phone book under your own name. You cannot republish a collection in the format that things are, are done. So you can't, you can't republish somebody's online catalog. You can't republish uh, eBay on your own website. You can't do that kind of stuff. Some information you can use uh, by fair use. And fair use is, is kind of vague. Um, it has to do with the nature of the copyrighted material that you're using the amount you're using, the purpose it was used for. So, for example, if you're doing it for academic purposes, um, you get a little more leeway than if you're trying to make money with it. The other thing that courts consider is whether or not what you're doing with the information reduces the originator's ability to make money on it or, or to do whatever it was that they intended on doing with it. The other area of online law is uh, trespass to chattels. Now, some of the traditional definitions of trespass to chattels, basically it means preventing somebody from using their own property. So, for example, if you're going to block access to someone's boat because you built a swim platform, that would be a violation of trespass to chattels. If you prevent somebody from using the fax machine because you keep spamming it with junk faxes, that would be an example of trespass to chattels. Or if somebody has a nice ocean view, and you build a building and you block their view of the ocean. Um, that's not a real strong case, but that's something that could be considered trespass to chattels. Now, online definitions of trespass to chattels are, are, are pretty similar. Uh, for example, if you've got a website that you're hitting very hard and you're consuming so much bandwidth that you affect their performance, that is a direct trespass to chattels violation. And uh, it's not hard to do that. I mean, even an old, old uh, IBM PC 386, if you write the code effectively, you can generate enough traffic where you completely flood out a T1. So it's, it's not hard to do that. Um, if you increase the network activity on somebody's network to the point where they need to add infrastructure just to support your bot, um, that's a definite trespass to chattels um, violation. Or another example is if you create so much email that you affect someone's usefulness with a mail server. 
It's another definition of trespass to travelers. These are all things that you want to avoid doing. Um, personal story, um, I was doing some work for a, uh, a credit agency and doing my work I was spidering a, um, a court website for one of the, the states here in the United States. And I started out on a Saturday morning and I started off and I had a lot of delays and I was doing things very slowly, making it look like a person doing it, you know, being very respectful of my source. And I'm looking at the amount of data that I need to collect. I'm thinking, my gosh, and I did some quick math, and I realized it was going to take me probably a week to collect the data that I needed to collect. So I realized, well, I need to speed things up a little bit. So I kind of opened things up a little bit, and maybe I opened things up too much because I eventually got a, a, a page came up, and it was a warning from the state saying that uh, I need to call them immediately on Monday morning. They've got my IP address, and uh, it's probably just best that I give them a call. So this scared the heck out of me. Uh, so I'm figuring, well, uh, this is a state. It's a court system. They've got better lawyers than I have, and they've got my IP address. They can subpoena my ISP and figure out exactly who I am. So I was a little nervous about this, um, and this is the only time I've ever done anything like this. So I'm, I'm like, freaking out. Uh, that Monday morning, the very first thing I did, I waited for the court. Um, systems offices to open. I called the phone number that was on the screen and it turned out that I was talking to a very overworked system admin who said, um, oh, don't worry about it. Just, um, you know, make sure you don't access our website more often than, say, every 20 seconds. And I said, really? That's it? She goes, yep, that's it. So it ended happily, but it, it could have ended not quite so happily. And that's, that's, that's probably the scariest personal story I have for writing webbots. So let my lesson be a lesson to you. I'll let my story be a lesson to you. All right, I want to talk real quickly uh, about dealing with difficult websites. And by difficult websites, um, I'm talking about uh, primarily websites with a lot of JavaScript, because JavaScript is very difficult to handle, uh, especially when you're just downloading pages and parsing and you don't have a JavaScript interpreter. Uh, I'm going to show you how macros can solve these problems. And then after I show you how that works, I'm going to show you how you can write scripts that uh, actually will automate the process of developing browser macros so you can do some really cool stuff. Uh, you can take your browser macro and you can tie it into your data, your data center, your, your databases. Uh, you can have front ends um, that write macros. Uh, you can have um, servers write macros for you. Now, discuss that later. So again, anytime you have a website where there's a lot of JavaScript going on, um, strange cookie behavior, I've seen some really strange things going on with cookies, where cookies are written sequentially. Uh, I've seen things where JavaScript is used to write cookies, all kinds of things that are very difficult to simulate. And they're actually even difficult to, to watch if you're, if you're sitting there with a network sniffer trying to figure out what certain websites are doing. There's some pretty complex stuff going on out there. Um, the other thing that, that really makes it difficult to write screen scrapers is when people are using Ajax, because uh, bots primarily assume that once you download a page, the page is done formatting. Well, Ajax allows additional content, of course, to be downloaded, uh, which makes it very difficult to use things like um, my lib, lib uh, HTTP. The other thing that makes websites difficult to scrape and to, to use with automated agents is uh, Flash. And um, browser macros take care of most of the Flash stuff as well. So something I'd like you to do this afternoon when you get a chance is go online and do a quick search for something called iMacros. It is an add-on for Firefox. It's an add-on for Internet Explorer. Uh, there's an experimental version available for Chrome, and they also write their own browser, which is actually an adaptation of Internet Explorer that has iMacros built into it. And basically what iMacros does, it, it's a really quick download. It goes right into your browser. I typically use the version for Firefox. Um, every now and then you'll get into a situation where you have to use the one for Internet Explorer, which I think works quite as well. Um, 
So I primarily use the one for Firefox. And what it'll do is it'll open up a little pane like what you see on the left side of the browser. And when you hit record, basically what it'll do is it'll record all of your, your mouse clicks. And it'll record where your mouse is and what you're clicking on. If you're filling up rooms, it'll record all that kind of stuff. Um, so in this example, I'm basically going to the website and I'm clicking on a couple links and I'm downloading a couple pages. And in the process here is I am creating a macro. And the macro looks something like this. I'll wait for your screens to update a little bit. And you can see basically what it is is it tells us we're using tab one and we're going to a URL and then we're saving a page and then we're um, basically clicking on a link, and then we're saving that page, and then we're clicking on another link, and then we're saving that page. Well, let's take an, a little closer look at this. Get, this. get this up on the screen here. So again, we're going to a page, saving it, clicking on a link, saving the page, clicking on a link, saving the page. I'm going to show you this in itself is very useful. This is almost like having a extended bookmark. So if you've got something that you do all the time, like log into your bank or, or something where you do, um, you know, it, it could even be something like logging into your credit card's website and making a payment that you do every month. You could easily automate something like that with iMacros. I'm going to show you a little hack here that makes it really useful. In the highlighted areas here, Again, I'll wait for your screens to update. In the highlighted areas here, we're doing something um, a little bit that you won't find in the iMacros documentation. And what we're doing is you have to remember that you can go to any web page you want to. Um, in this particular case, we go to a web site or a web page that's on the same machine as the one running iMacros. So in other words, in this particular case, I've got a local instance of Apache running, and I've got a little program there called Process. And what Process does is it goes and it loads the file that we just downloaded, and it can do anything it wants to with it at that point. It can do some parsing, it can pull information out, it can upload information to uh, another server, it can put information to a database, it can do all kinds of cool stuff. So suddenly we just added a, a really cool feature here to iMacros that's Again, not documented in the iMacros documentation. Um, basically, anything you can do in your machine, anything you can write in a PHP program, or for that matter, any web page back end, you can do in iMacros. So you can automate all kinds of really cool stuff with this. If you're interested in this kind of thing, if you go to my website and look at my DEF CON 17 talk, I talk about this technique a lot. So that might be something you want to do. So you can, you can extend this little hack a little bit further by writing scripts that do things like automatically launching iMacros. You can interface iMacros to a database, again, simply by having a script that runs, and it's got a little template that, you know, it, it is your, your basic macro. It hits the database, grabs the information it's looking for, inserts that into your macro, and then launches your, your macro, and it's, it's dynamically generated, and it's very, very useful. Uh, you can use this kind of thing to interface your macro to a centralized server. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, you can also, when you generate a dynamic macro for iMacros, you can also do things like insert um, um, delays of various types, make things look a little more random, a little more human, all very useful stuff. And again, stuff that you won't see in the iMacros documentation. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about, and again, I'm covering a lot of stuff very quickly here, and I realize that. Um, um, stealth comes up, and, and basically what stealth is is the ability to create a, uh, a web bot that operates and without being detected too much. And basically uh, the way you do it is by imitating human behavior the best you can. And a large part of that is limiting access to the website that you're, that you're going to. Um, that's very, very important. Uh, I get a lot of requests from people, and I get a lot of really crazy requests 
um, there's one person who wanted me to um, look at prices on Amazon.com because this person was an Amazon merchant and wanted me to go out and look at the products that this person had for sale and go off and see what competing people were um, selling the exact same products for. And he wanted me to access Amazon, basically download several million pages a day. And I knew that just wasn't going to happen because um, <laughs> they're going to cut you off because uh, you're just, again, it's, it's a trespass to chattels issue. Uh, you can't access your sources that much. Um, so one of the things about being stealthy, and I'm a firm believer of this, is that the more you can go and be undetectable, really the more respectful you're being to the people that you're downloading information from, the sites that you're going to. Uh, you've got to act like a person. You can't act like a computer gone mad that's just consuming information as quickly as they can get it because you're going to run into trouble if you do that kind of thing. It's not good for you, and it's not good for the people that you have the information that you're trying to process. The other thing I'll talk about very quickly is proxies in this area. And there's a number of reasons for using proxies that aren't entirely obvious. Okay, the reasons for being stealthy. Um, again, the, the main reason is to maintain a competitive advantage. Um, some of the reasons you might want to do this is uh, you might not want a competitor to know that you're monitoring their Help Wanted page. And again, that's a, that's a very effective way of doing corporate intelligence. Uh, if you can find out what your competitor's hiring practices are, uh, you can figure out what their long-term strategies are, if they're in a growth cycle or whatever. Um, if you're doing that, you probably don't want your corporate IP address sitting in their log files. Um, another reason for being stealthy is that, again, you've got to remember you're trying to create a competitive advantage for your client. And if there's an online supplier, for example, um, they might want to make it real sure that all of the people accessing their, their stuff is all playing on a level playing field. Well, as a bot developer, and I'm trying to d deliver a competitive advantage for my client, um, that's probably not what I want. So we've got conflicting interests there. Then the last one is that not all administrators are really understanding what you're doing. Uh, I can remember one time, actually, uh, I wasn't as stealthy as maybe I should have been, and I got a call from an administrator who was like, you know, we're noticing some really unusual stuff in our network, and it's all coming from you what the heck are you doing? Well, I talked to the guy for a while, and I finally convinced him that what we're doing is actually in his best interest because we were doing a lot of business with them, and if we weren't able to conduct business with the bot, uh, we would take our business elsewhere. And it was actually to their benefit that we were doing what we were doing. And uh, once we had that conversation, um, we were all good again, and everybody was happy. But again, what we're trying to do here with the bots is we're trying to deliver a competitive advantage for clients. That's what it's all about. For our clients, for our employers, that's the reason we're writing bots. That is the only reason we're writing bots. So again, the way you, you maintain stealth is you imitate human behavior. And part of that is by putting in random delays. That's very important. Um, you don't ever want to work faster than what's humanly possible because that a, it, it, it's bad for the source that you're using, <clears throat> plus it makes you look like a machine. Um, you want to make sure you let your bots work regular hours. Um, you know, they shouldn't work weird hours. Don't, don't think that you're going to go undetected if you run your bots at 2 in the morning. Uh, it's better to be during normal business hours where there's lots of traffic where you just kind of blend in. Uh, you should let your bots take regular breaks. Uh, my bots, you know, start in the morning, they end in the afternoon. They take lunch, they take smoke breaks in the afternoon and in the morning, you know, just, just like a regular person does. That's what you should do. Um, it's also good that you don't schedule your bots to work on Christmas or New Year's and that kind of stuff because that, that's a pretty good indication that it's probably not a person doing that kind of stuff. Uh, you want to um, limit your activity, and that's, that's really key. Uh, you want to avoid trespass to chattel situations, and you always – always want to be respectful to the sites that you're downloading. Um, again, I, I turn down a lot of work because people have business models that are just not respectful to the websites that they're, they're accessing. And those kind of business models are very short-lived. And 
I like to make sure I get paid. So it's good that they've got good, solid business models. Okay, proxies a little bit. Uh, why use a proxy? Uh, a proxy is basically, uh, whether it's in real life or online, it's basically something that acts on your behalf. So people use proxies online because they can significantly add to your stealth. Uh, if you want, they can make it look like uh, you're, you're coming from another place, you're someplace else. Um, or they can make it look like you're actually in a different locality. And that can be really useful for testing uh, website regionalization kinds of things. Or, for example, with some of my journalists, uh, if you can find a proxy in Cuba, you can find out what the Internet looks like from within Cuba or, you know, name any other country. Uh, if you want to look at what the news sites are like in Iran, for example, or any place, uh, find a proxy in that country and you'll, you're basically transported to that country. So here's how proxies work. Uh, without a proxy, and, and generally you're always using a proxy of some type. If not, it's your computer and the website, and whatever you do ends up being logged at that website, and they can see everything you're doing. Now, if you do that and they have access to your IP address, which is important, uh, they can figure out at the very least who your ISP is, uh, you know, what locality you're coming from, and you're basically leaving a footprint that's identifiable. If you use a proxy, on the other hand, between you and uh, the website that you're looking at, uh, something magical happens. Uh, first off, your, your location or, or your IP address that goes onto the website is not your IP address anymore. It's the IP address of the proxy server. Uh, regardless of where that happens to be, that's where your, your access point that's where it looks like your point of origination is. Um, the other thing that happens is that your traffic gets mixed with a lot of other traffic, and that's good because it's not just you now. It's a lot of people coming from that particular IP address. And, uh, you know, if you're on, like, a really big uh, server, like something out of AOL or something like that, um, it's pretty hard to who somebody is, uh, even with, you know, clever cookie usage. Um, you, you basically blend in with a lot of other traffic. Now, there are a number of proxies available, and the ones that people talk about a lot are these open proxies. Uh, if you do a quick search on the Internet, you can find all kinds of proxies that you can use in all different kinds of countries. Um, I, I caution you not to use these because uh, most of these, at best, are servers that are misconfigured, and basically they've got some relaying open, and the people that own these servers don't even know that they're being used as open proxies. Uh, in other cases, uh, these proxies are done by basically people want to see what you're doing. Uh, organized crime uses proxies like this. Uh, I, I know law enforcement uses proxies like this as, as uh, you know, honeypot kind of stuff. I basically say you should avoid these at all costs. Uh, certainly never use a proxy like this to transmit any kind of sensitive information like uh, logging criteria or um, anything like that. Uh, I do suggest using something called Tor, and uh, if you want to go out and uh, do a quick Google search on Tor, you can find out some, some wonderful things about Tor. It's, it's a free open source proxy. It's maintained by the community, and as of recently, it's become really quite fast. I'm really quite impressed with it. There are also commercial proxies that are available, and pricing and quality can vary quite a bit. Uh, the really good services, I have to tell you, are really quite expensive. So again, to wrap the section on stealth, uh, the reasons for being stealthy are primarily to, to preserve your competitive advantage. It's not to be sneaky. It's, it's basically not to let your competition know what you're doing. Uh, you do it by imitating human behavior. You limit access. Again, my belief is that being stealthy is, is pretty much the same as being respectful to your sites. Um, you know, you're, you're basically not disturbing the universe. That's, that's kind of my definition of being stealthy. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and we've got about 10 minutes here, I want to talk about deployment and scaling. Uh, deployment is largely determined by the web bot geometries, something we talk about quickly. Um, you're going to learn how to avoid denial of service attacks because if you've got a really big project going on, it's really easy to completely flood out uh, a website, and you don't want to do that. Um, I'm going to show you ways of maintaining multiple instances of a web bot 
and then once you got it all tied together and you got a bunch of web bots all running in Harmony, uh, you're basically managing a botnet at this point, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Some of the geometries. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is what I refer to as one-to-many, and that's where you've got one web bot that's accessing many, many different websites. Uh, in this case, there are a few precautions, and an example might be a web bot that is monitoring prices, for example, on a lot of different um, online shopping websites. Another geometry is the one-to-one, -one. and in this case, you've got uh, one web bot basically accessing one target website. And here you've got some precautions now. You want to be a little bit of stealthy. You want to make sure you don't create a denial of service attack, uh, which you can do if you access it way too much. Um, and again, an example here would be a web bot that analyzes prices just on one website. It's a little trickier to pull that kind of thing off. Uh, another geometry, many-to-many, -many. and here you've got many web bots that are accessing many websites. Um, here you've got fewer precautions, and the classic example here would be like a search engine like Google or Bing, where they've got lots and lots of agents going off, and they are accessing many, many, many websites and collecting lots of data that way. And then the last one I want to talk about, and this is probably the most dangerous one, is the many-to-one. We've got many web bots that are all accessing one target website. Uh, precautions, it's, it's best to avoid these if you can all do it, because uh, you're opening yourself up to trespass to chattels, lawsuits, and this would be an example where you've got a web bot that scrapes content uh, from a court website like uh, I was doing years ago and got in trouble with. Uh, you want to avoid this as much as possible. Okay, my favorite way of creating, when you've got multiple web bots running, web bots running, and perhaps they're all accessing the same database, you know, they're, they're getting information uh, from a list of uh, URLs. My favorite way of doing it is basically to rely on the operating system. Um, so just create a bunch of instances that are running in shells, and that works really nicely. Uh, I much prefer doing this to forking processes within a single web bot. Uh, because it's basically just a lot easier to do, and there's really no reason to complicate things by writing a bot that makes multiple accesses to multiple websites. Um, the other thing I like to do is I like to manage bots from a central server. Uh, so you can do this for your many-to-one and many-to-many -many kind of uh, geometries, where you've got a central server that basically tells individual web bots uh, a task that they need to do and uh, receives that information and, and processes it. So basically it works something like this. Um, you've got a web bot that pulls a botnet server and it sends a task request. Um, it identifies itself and basically it's using HTTP post form, so it's using a post. And when this happens, the central server will determine if there's something for that particular web bot to do, because sometimes there's not. Uh, sometimes it's you know, time for a break or maybe this auto information. Um, as soon as it finds a task, it checks out that task. So it says, okay, this particular task is being performed by this particular bot. And it's important to check out the task because if you don't do that, um, you know, if, if something happens to the bot and it doesn't come back, you know, that checkout can time out so you can give that same task off to another web bot then if you want to. So next step is to assign the task. So basically there's some HTML or rather there's some XML that gets sent back to the bot and the boss, I got an example there where it's using um, return between from wood parse to parse off what the task is. The task is performed and then it uploads whatever information it was looking for uh, back to the um, server and the server again can tell it specifically what it's looking for and then that information is stored in a database, all on a nice central database uh, the beautiful thing here is that it's easy to scale this kind of thing because you scale basically by just adding more bots, and uh, the scaling happens very easily. So a quick look at what we covered today. We covered a lot of stuff very quickly, and I understand that. Uh, we talked about what are the opportunities today for bot developers, gave you some suggestions for potential projects. We talked a little bit about uh, development basics where um, um, you know, how, how to download, how to manage cookies, uh, how to parse, that kind of stuff, how to emulate forms. We talked a bit about online property rights, both copyright and trespass to chattels. 
We talked a bit about dealing with difficult websites through the use of iMacros. We brushed on web bots and stealth, talked about the reasons for doing it and how to, how to actually do it. And then finally, we talked just a little bit about large-scale deployment of distributed bots. And again, if you're interested in that, uh, there's also a good piece of that on my website, uh, the video for the um, DEF CON 17 talk. That's all online. So I want to thank you again for your time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed presenting it to you. And uh, good luck with your bots. Uh, there's my email address if you have questions. Uh, make sure you, you let me know. And if you're doing something cool with WebBots too, I also like to hear about that. Uh, again, the libraries are available at WebBots Spider Screen Scrapers, and I thank you for your time. Mike, outstanding webcast today. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions that came in, and it looks like we may have time to take some. Uh, would you sure. like me to read them to you, or did you want to take a peek in that Q&A box? Um, you know, I think I'd rather have you read them to me because uh, I haven't had time to really look at these yet. And sure, I'll let let's you do pick it. Which ones we should do? It. Sure. <laughs> okay, okay. Great questions from you folks out there, and we're just going to take them in the order they came in. We do have a question that came in earlier on in the webcast from Todd, and Todd asked, "Are the libraries different slash updated from the first edition?" They are not. They are the exact same libraries. Great. And then we have a question from. Sherard. Sherard asks, how can I make sure I'm accessing the latest version of the web page I am attempting to parse? Uh, well, if you, if you download a fresh copy of it, uh, you should be getting the latest version of it. Um, and if you're using uh, PHP curl, like I suggest, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about any kind of caching that goes on because uh, PHP curl does no caching, unlike a browser does. Um, so as long as you're using PHP curl, I think you'll be fine in that regard. Great. And a question from Khaled. Khaled asks, can we run PHP slash curl bots on a non-hosted machine like, say, my laptop? Yeah, I do it all the time. In fact, I'm sitting here in my office and I've got bots running all around me. They're running on non-hosted systems. In fact, uh, that's really the way I prefer to do it. And again, what I suggest doing is you basically make your laptop into a, a hosted environment where you go and you download a copy of WAP server and that'll install Apache, PHP, MySQL, all on your machine. And you run it on your machine, your laptop, as long as you connect it to the Internet, it's just like running on a hosted environment. Thank you. And a question from Alberto. Alberto asks, how big can the data set resulting from a web bot's foraging B, what's a good starting storage requirement um, for these things? Uh, the biggest one I ever ran into in, in my own work, I think, was about 6 million lines in a MySQL database. And 6 million in MySQL is, is not a big deal. I didn't notice any kind of performance problems with that. So I wouldn't worry about that a whole lot. Um, if you are worried about that, in my book I've got a chapter about dealing with large data sets. We talk about compression. We talk about um, stripping down things you don't need. We talk about thumbnailing images and that kind of stuff. So if you're dealing with just massive amounts of data, you might want to check out the book. Great. And just a couple more questions as our time winds down. Dustin asks, so if the page has multiple forms, how would you target a specific form? The way you do that, if there are multiple forms on a page, they all have to have unique um, action variables, in other words, the form handler. So either there's one form handler on the back end of that website that's smart enough to know which form you submitted, or there are individual form handlers for each one of the forms. So that's why it's really important that you go look at the HTML, study it, and make sure you know which form variables you need to upload and to which URL. That's, that's a very good question. Great. Another one comes in from Khaled. He asks, does your book cover how to work with user sessions? Uh, yes, it does. Um, there is a chapter on cookies and authentication. And uh, it definitely does. And when we look at sessions that are done through cookies, we look at sessions that are done as um, query variables, and we also look at uh, traditional, um, I forget what it's called, 
uh, basic authentication is also covered. So yes, the, the book does cover that. Okay, and folks, we just have time for a couple more questions here. We have one from Connor. Connor asks, how often do you find yourself having to modify your scripts because sites change their content, and how are you made aware of these changes? Great question. Uh, it really depends on the website. And I've had some bots that have run completely unattended for well over a year, and they work just beautifully because the, the, the website that you're getting information from doesn't change. In other cases, it can change fairly quickly, and I'm working with several situations like that. What you want to do is you want to make sure that if the source target website that you're looking at changes, that you fail gracefully. So in other words, um, your bot should recognize, it, it should have an idea for what it's looking for. And if it doesn't find what it's looking for, it should stop immediately. Um, a good thing for it to do also is to either send you an SMS or an email at that point and say, uh, this is bot you know, XYZ, I came into a problem with this particular website, here's the error that I have, and I am now no longer functioning. Because once you find an error, you don't want to function anymore. You want to, you want to stop it immediately. Perfect. Um, let's see here. Todd would like to know, how can I detect bots on my site? Very good question. Um, a really well-written bot, you're going to have a real difficult time detecting, uh, at least by looking at log files. Um, there's, a, there's a chapter in my book called Killing Spiders where I give you some ideas of things to do. For example, you can have links on your page that aren't visible, but would still get picked up by, for example, a search engine or something. Uh, so for example, you can have a link where what you would normally click on is maybe a transparent image. And no person is ever going to find that. They're not going to follow that link. But a machine might. And if they do that, you can redirect them to some page where you can create a log of everything that's followed that link, and you can assume it was a machine. Um, otherwise, the things to look for are repetitive patterns in uh, log files. Uh, most bots are not well written, and um, you start seeing very repetitive things, that things happening at the precise same time every day, that's probably a bot. Uh, the other thing to look at are the agent names. Uh, we talked a little bit about how PHP allows you to set up your agent name to whatever it is. Uh, if you look at your logs, you're going to find a lot of things in there that are not browsers. Um, simply because they're saying that they're not browsers. And uh, that's another good way of, of looking at it, too. And I think the final thing I would caution you against is not all bots are bad. In fact, you know, the ones that I do, I actually feel are beneficial to the sites that we're scraping because we're bringing business to them uh, for the most part. So, you know, there's not always cloak and dagger stuff going on. And it might actually be a good idea to find out who these are and, you know, find out, um, you know, whether they're, they're harming your business or not at first before you take any action. Fantastic. And time for just one more question. A few folks had this question, and I might um, not pronounce it correctly. How do you deal with CAPTCHAs? CAPTCHAs. Um, you know what? I, again, on my DEF CON 17 talk, uh, I conclude with a little discussion about CAPTCHAs. Um, there are actually services available that solve CAPTCHAs for you. Uh, if you go look at my DEF CON 17 talk, I'll, I'll teach you exactly how to deal with those kinds of things. Uh, but again, bots, uh, basically what happens is you look at the CAPTCHA image, you send it off to a service that has actual people that solve them for you, you'll get back multiple answers, and you look for the answers that are most common among the ones that you get back, and you submit that as your answer. That, that's the short answer for how you handle CAPTCHAs.